Hello, welcome to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics at the University of Florida Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. My name is Professor Steve Miller, and it's my pleasure to present to you this course. Every course in this series of courses will have a brief outline of each class. Uh, at the end of each class, we'll also have a summary and a discussion of what we'll talk about in the following class. So in this class, I'm going to talk about who am I in my research, uh, the general course overview, uh, syllable, syllabus of the course. Um, this course has a huge dichotomy and philosophy behind it. The dichotomy is in CFD, that there's two sides of it. One, of course, is just the process of CFD, and the other side is just the skepticism. There's also the dichotomy of teaching a course in the university setting and also being a practicing CFD uh, engineer, for example, in industry. There's also the philosophy of CFD in the course. We'll talk some about that here, too. In this course, we're going to show three major lessons, not only in this course, but through the rest of the semester. The first, of course, is CFD, which has three major steps, and I'll be saying them over and over again throughout the semester. The first is pre-processing, the second is the solver, and the third is post-processing. Then, of course, there'll be the skepticism of CFD. This is the second major lesson of CFD, which you just must keep with you throughout your career. Skepticism doesn't mean that you just don't believe something, but you want to be able to check the validity of the results to see if they're correct. In this course, we're going to be studying CFD and executing codes and creating solutions, numerical solutions, through basically uh, an open source solver. Um, we'll also look at a visualization solver, which or software, which is very popular, and we'll look at the generation of these computational grids. The vast majority of CFT solvers have to be run on what we call a computational grid. And in this class, we'll talk some about what each of these things are. After that, of course, we'll have a discussion of the commercial solvers. Um, Commercial solvers can easily be learned once you learn any other approach. Um, it's just a different piece of code. Typically, commercial solvers have all three major components of CFD in them. They have the grid generation, problem definition, boundary conditions. They have the actual solver, which solves the, the flow field, and they have a visualization system. And these are made by companies. Uh, of course, and are sold to the market uh, and you can buy licenses. So there's often a commercial version um, of these softwares that have like a student edition, which are completely free. And they're just kind of limited by the number and size of the problems you can uh, solve. Uh, one example might be Fluent Student Edition. And of course, you're free to explore that. In this class, we'll be providing software through the class website, but it's also open source and completely free online. So anybody anywhere can try out these solvers. Also in this class, we'll talk about the basics of CFD. Uh, who is it? What is it? Where is it? Why do we use it? And when do we use it? And we'll also be talking about some about the perspective my perspective, this personal perspective on this class from the point of view through, through someone who's been using CFD themselves and teaching CFD students uh, for years. So first, I want to talk about a brief biography about myself. Um, I already mentioned I'm a professor at the University of Florida, Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, I was the 2019 uh, United States Air Force, Air Force Research Lab Faculty Fellow. And I spent my previous life in NASA, which I'll be showing a few pictures of in a few minutes. Uh, I was a civil servant there from 2009 to 2016, and I had the title of Research Aerospace Engineer. And I was in the aeroacoustics branch working as a theoretical aeroacoustician, mainly on supersonic jet flows. But I did all kinds of problems from the whole space side of NASA all the way down to you know, fundamental research on flows and acoustics and turbulence. I was involved in experiments, computations, and theory, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, as far as my education, I got my PhD at Penn State University in, in aerospace engineering under a NASA grant. I had a um, master's degree also from a National Renewable Energy Lab grant, also in aerospace engineering from Penn State. My advisor there was Philip Morris. Uh, I, I came to Penn State from Michigan State University where I got my bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering. And before then, I, and I also studied in Tegernog State University in the Russian Federation, which is now in Rostov on the Don, 
which is, if you don't know, is like in Southwest Russia. So I did statistical studies there and some minor language and cultural studies. I also studied some in Eastern Michigan University. And you see the Michigan connection here, so of course you can imagine I had a lot of my early life in Michigan. My research group is called the Theoretical Fluid Dynamics and Turbulence Group. We are completely interested in turbulence physically and mathematically. We want to understand the mathematics behind turbulence, what are the appropriate mathematical models and how do we solve them. We want to study the underlying equations, which we'll talk more about in this class, which are the Navier-Stokes equations. And we also want to understand the physics, because if you don't understand the physics of these equations, you cannot possibly go and, and, and do work with them. And this, is, this physical understanding is just key to CFD. And I'm just going to show some turbulent slides to remind our students what those are. Our group is also interested in understanding how sound is produced by and propagated through turbulent fields. This is an extremely complicated problem in the mathematics and engineering and physics community that's been studied and is currently being studied in our group and many groups around the world to see how sound is produced by the turbulence and how it propagates through these flows. This is critical in the aerospace industry and also many other industries. So you can probably think to yourself, hey, where are these flows uh, studied? Another thing I'm really interested in is just central questions in the field of fluid dynamics. There's much research being done in this very elegant, mathematically intense and old subject on fluid dynamics. It's, it's a beautiful subject, so if you fall in fluid dynamics, you'll have a lifetime of um, excellent research and mathematical beauty to try and examine. There's multiple ways to study and solve fluid dynamic problems in general across all industries and research areas and academics and government. The first is analytical, the second is computational, and the third is, is experimental. And we'll talk more about these in this class. Uh, analytical, when I say analytical, I mean specifically from an engineering point of view of going down on paper and doing the mathematics, doing the theory. So this might be on your you know, bar napkin or a piece of paper or you're in the library writing on a whiteboard. This is the act of doing math to try and solve computational problems, or excuse me, fluid dynamic problems. The second is computationally, which is what this focus of this class is. That just means I'm solving some sort of equations that, that uh, maybe model the fluid flow uh, numerically. I'm numerically solving the problem. Or maybe I've done some analytical work to find some set of equations which model a fluid flow and I solve them numerically. That's what the, the process of solving these fluid dynamic equations are in computational fluid dynamics. It means we're solving the equations numerically. Finally, experimental approaches. We can look at experimental approaches. These might be something like a wind tunnel test as an example or, or test, flight tests in the atmosphere. Um, it could be an automobile in the wind tunnel, anything, uh, you know, blood flows through arteries and hearts. There's all kinds of examples of um, experiments. So that's just using uh, nature in a way to reduce it to the minimum set of criteria to isolate the physical phenomena. That's the experiment. And there's all levels of experiment from very simple fundamental experiments all the way up to, you know, full scale flight tests in the aerospace engineering industry. So my personal research focuses on analytical and computational methods, the combination of analytical and computational methods. Um, I prefer to do com completely analytical methods, but as you see as you are in this field longer and longer, and in this class, it's often very much difficult, if not impossible, for people to solve these equations with specific boundary conditions to solve fluid flow problems, especially when they're turbulent flows. And that's why we're very fortunate to have digital computers today, which are very powerful and can solve these problems numerically. So this class focuses on computational methods, that is solving equations that model fluid flows numerically. And this is a huge and difficult field which people have spent their careers on, and even little subsets of this part of the field. So going through this class, if you see something that you're really interested in, know that you can dive deep in that area. This class is an introduction class giving you a survey of, of everything that I think is important in the field um, to understand it, to go on and do research in it, or go straight to industry. Students taking this class have gone on to um, industries like uh, Gulfstream, for example, in their CFD groups or GE aircraft engines. We've had students from, from our university go into these industries, just as a, two quick examples, into their CFD groups. 
So I do want to talk a little bit uh, more about myself here, just give you an idea of my background so you can understand uh, my experiences and how I bring them into this class. Uh, this is a picture at NASA Langley Research Center. And what you're seeing here in this large end of this exhaust tube, it's essentially a huge tube. This is about eight foot off the ground from the bottom of the lower lip of the tube. You'll see a set of people there. Those are actually some of my students when I was a NASA researcher at NASA Langley Research Center. This is the tail end of the hypersonic, one of the hypersonic tunnels. And uh, this tunnel is extremely powerful and I'll talk more about it through the class and a little bit about its use. Um, I was very passionate about having students at NASA and I'm very fortunate to be a professor now where I can work with many students. That's very exciting. Uh, a lot of the reasons we are doing computational fluid dynamics now is because of the issue of turbulence. Turbulence in itself has been studied and examined as part of the field of fluid dynamics for a very, very long time and much longer than the, the use of CFD has been really around. Um, this is a picture on your right of Sir Horace Lamb, fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, and he actually wrote a book called Hydrodynamics and the Dynamical Theory of Sound. So if you understand acoustics and hydrodynamics, you actually have a leg up in the field of turbulence. And having a very strong math background is very helpful too. And really turbulence itself is one of the last great problems in fluid dynamics and classical physics, of course. Uh, so if you're in the physics department, there are still people in the physics department who study fluid dynamics. But a lot of physicists might say, oh, the turbulence problem is sort of something we're not interested in because the equations of motion, which might be considered the Navier-Stokes equations, are pretty much found. But there's lots of fundamental work done in turbulence and fluid dynamics in the math and physics, and it's predominantly done in the engineering community now. Anyway, Horace Lamb, rather long ago in 1932, in an address to the British Association for the Advancement of Science, he wrote, I'm an old man now, and when I die and go to heaven, there are two matters on which I hope for enlightenment. One is the quantum electrodynamics, and the other is the turbulent motion of fluids. And about the former, I am rather optimistic. What's so interesting about this quote is it's been sort of used by scientists and engineers and mathematicians uh, and requoted with their own field. For example, um, uh, Richard Feynman once said a very similar quote about his field, and he was in quantum electrodynamics. Just to give you some idea of what turbulence is, and we'll define it more later in this class, we have a whole module on turbulence, I wanted to show some tests from uh, NASA Langley where they're studying the Quest vehicle. So in this picture, we see the NASA Quest smoke vortex at Langley 14 by 22 foot wind tunnel. And what we're doing is we're standing in the downstream section of the wind tunnel. The downstream section is the section where you might consider it's part of the test section where you put the test article, which you can see in the middle of the screen, and we're looking upstream. That means we're looking into the wind of the wind tunnel as the air flows from the front to the back. And what you see here is a gentleman down in the lower left near the entrance of the test section, which is that sort of yellowish area, yellow area where the airflow is coming in. And he's holding a rod, and what goes through that rod is a smoke. And the smoke comes out and it's entrained in the flow when it comes up over to the top of the vehicle. He can move it around and it, it sort of swirls around. And here you can see it's a rather uh, laminar stream almost, and it's coming up and it's curling around in three dimensions over the top and it's in being entrained in a vortex which trans which which moves downstream the vehicle itself of course is from uh, this new X plane uh, which is currently at the time of this video being uh, built by Lockheed Martin for for tests for sonic boom so this is a prototype of that vehicle looking upstream at it let's try and look at another picture of this particular uh, vehicle here's a close-up from a different angle and what you see in the lower left is the uh, smoke screen, which is in front of the vehicle. It's coming up and it's almost hitting the wingtip of the vehicle. And it's coming around and swirling around and swirling up. This is really a visualization of the tip vortex, which is coming off the wing. And you can kind of look in the smoke itself and see it's becoming smeared and swirled. And I wish they had a, sh a shorter exposure camera because you would be able to start to see all these fine little turbulent eddies, all these little vortices, billions and trillions of little vortices which are forming in the flow. 
The issue with CFD is you would have to try and predict the whole turbulent flow around this particular aircraft um, to be able to predict its lift and drag and other interesting quantities uh, that are useful for aerospace engineers. Uh, anyway, this represents an experiment. So along with this experiment, teams went in and they did some analytical or semi-empirical work, and they also did a lot of CFD before they went into the wind tunnel. Today, CFD is combined hand in hand with the work being done with experimentalists. So there's very rare to be in a large aerospace industry situation where you don't have a CFD component of your development and research program. So let's talk about this course itself. And here's the official course description from the class syllabus. And let me just read it to you and we can explain it. This course introduces students to the general theories, numerical algorithms, and processes of computational fluid dynamics. The main objectives are to understand the pre-process that includes the definition of the problem and grid generation, the solver and post-process that includes analysis of the results. Students will learn to interpret computational fluid dynamics results and develop skepticism that is balanced by verification and validation techniques. Throughout the course, concepts will be illustrated through the use of one popular computational fluid dynamics solver, which we'll talk about in the live Zoom call. The students will have fundamental knowledge of boundary conditions, grid generation, solvers, turbulence modeling, visualization, numerical methods, and a variety of special topics at the termination of the course. So let's talk about some of these highlighted uh, words. We're going to be talking about general theories. So we're going to go back and look at equations of motion, turbulence modeling, um, physics of fluids, and how this relates to the CFD solvers and process of solving equations numerically. The numerical algorithms themselves are, might, might be what you learned in a numerical methods course, or numerical analysis, or linear algebra, or solution of nonlinear partial differential equations. There's hundreds, if not many thousands, of numerical methods that are applicable to CFD. We're going to look at the most popular ones in this course that you might see in commercial solvers or in the solvers we're using to teach this in our course. We'll also talk about the processes of computational fluid dynamics. There's lots of those. This might be more of industry practice or research practice. The main objectives and what I want you to take away from this first course in CFD is how is to understand what you do before you perform the CFD. How do you set up the problems? How do you define the problems? What are boundary conditions? How do you specify them? Boundary conditions, remember, are the conditions on the edge of the fluid domain. And then when I say fluid, mind you, it could be a liquid, a gas, or a plasma. So fluid is an all-encompassing word for those three states of matter. Then we'll talk about a lot about grid generation. Grids are these computational uh, domains which represent where we want to solve the solution in the fluid domain. And we'll talk about that a lot uh, through the course, uh, so more on that later. The solver, when I say the solver, which is the second major step of CFD, that is when we are physically, I'm not, excuse me, numerically solving the equations of motion. And we'll have a number of classes on that. Then once you have done all that, you will post-process those results, and that will include the analysis of the results. So that's where you're predicting your lift, your drag, you're visualizing these results, and you're making all these beautiful, colorful pictures. Uh, if you like that, if you have some artistic sense, you'll really enjoy that. So students will learn to interpret all these results, and you'll be able to do all this, and you'll have the basic building blocks to go into a work CFD group in industry or continue in grad school and do research, which is very exciting. You'll also develop skepticism. Your skepticism might, will define very clearly later, but it's the idea that are my results correct? And how do you do that in a scientific way? Well, we'll be talking about balancing skepticism with techniques of verification and validation. And these might be, for example, uh, which we'll talk more about later, of is my solution independent of the computational domain? You'll have all this and get a fundamental knowledge of the topics which we um, listed on slide nine. So let's talk about the course schedule and overview for this semester of the senior elective in aerospace engineering of introduction to computational fluid dynamics. First, week, the first three days, we'll talk about preliminaries. 
So this is the first day of three on the preliminaries of the class. Then we'll have another three classes on introductory and review materials. So we'll be talking about mathematics, we'll be talking about physics of fluids, reminding what you should have learned in your fluids classes, thermodynamics, dynamics, uh, especially your differential equations class. And if you've taken a partial differential equations class, that would be wonderful. If you haven't taken these classes, it's gonna be very difficult to th go through this class. You don't technically need a course in compressible flow to understand shock waves and expansions, but it would be extremely helpful. Then we'll talk about grid generation, and that's uh, part of the pre-process of CFD. That's one of the first things we're gonna do first, and it, it's a time-consuming and difficult process. There are people in industries whose full-time job is to create these computational domains, and it's very difficult. Uh, as far as the time people spend doing CFD, that's where most people spend their time. They don't spend most of their time, their time, uh, in the second or third phase of CFD. We'll have about six classes on understanding fluid dynamics and all the equations of fluid dynamics that are applicable to CFD and how they're being discretized and moved into the solver. So that's a lot of physics and math and equations which make the basis of this field. And I'll try and talk about relevant equations uh, you know, that you can use in your future careers. Next, we'll have a number of classes on boundary conditions. Boundary conditions drive solutions of computational fluid dynamics along with initial conditions. And we'll have a number of classes talking about all the different types of boundary conditions and how they're used in different solvers, commercial and research solvers, how to set them, what the equations are, um, best practices for setting boundary conditions, and of course, you know, where they should be placed. We'll also talk about numerics. And when I say numerics, I really mean numerical methods uh, for solving the equations, for discretizing the equations uh, relative to fluid dynamics. We'll talk about their practice, and of course, there's different numerical schemes for different types of problems. And a really good CFD practitioner or someone who's doing research in CFD is going to choose the correct numerical method for, of course, the correct problem. Then we'll talk about visualization. And many students think that visualization is probably one of the most exciting parts of CFD. Visualization is where you take the numerical results from the solver, that's the values of densities, velocities, pressures, temperatures, etc., and and examine them, you know, make plots, make contour plots, make isosurface plots. And we'll have about three to four classes on visualization. And we'll talk about best practices of visualization also. We'll talk a little bit about parallelization of visualization, which means when I have really large data sets, you know, big data, if you will, is a, is a buzzword today, which is very popular. And we'll talk about how visualization is done in the industry. It should be very interesting. And a lot of students really love the visualization uh, part of the class. Then we'll talk about what is perhaps the most difficult part of fluid dynamics, uh, which is of course turbulence. And a subfield of turbulence, of course, is turbulence modeling. We'll talk about turbulence modeling in the context of CFD. We will not be so much talking about analytical turbulence modeling. Uh, this will give you just a brief overview of the difficulty of the problem. We'll define very clearly what turbulence is and how the turbulence models are integrated with the equations of motion. And there's different kinds of turbulence models which are maybe more expensive or cheaper to use computationally. We'll talk about what that means too in the context of this course and practicing CFD. Very interesting. Uh, near the end of the class, we'll have a variety of special topics. Right now we have maybe five or six. These include combustion, aeroelasticity, and aeroacoustics. These are all one class each. There's not really any homework or projects or anything to do with them. But you can see how CFD as a, a subject on its own is integrated with other subjects. And I think you'll appreciate that, especially today where you might have interest in other subjects. And CFD, is an, you might see it as a tool and it can help me solve maybe problems where I have, uh, you know, wobbling airfoils or flutter in aeroelasticity. Or if you're interested in combustion, you can use all your CFD techniques with chemistry models to solve those. And we're going to mainly give overviews. So, you know, one hour overviews of each of these special topics to give you an idea. Uh, when this class is taught in person uh, or online, we do project presentations. And at the end of the semester, typically students are going to present their class project. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the syllabus in our one-on-one -on -one discussions.
Brief over the syllabus, I'll talk more in detail. I'll just glance over it really quick here. The syllabus contains all the items you see on the screen here. Um, I'm the professor, uh, Steve Miller at University of Florida. I'll talk about my office hours. Uh, right now there's no teaching assistance, but sometimes there are. Uh, I'll announce those through the syllabus and online in our in our one-on-one -on -one discussions or uh, class discussions online. I've already talked some about the course objectives description and prereqs. Well, I'll go over those again. Um, there's a number of recommended textbooks, which are only recommended. You don't need to buy any textbook for this course. I'm going to distribute these slides as PDFs to the course. So you also have these slides and you have the accompanying videos and we'll have our online discussions. Uh, so you don't have to buy those. I do provide a lot of um, supplies and materials in terms of uh, reading, which I'll talk about in a second. You have all the CFT solvers and post processors and grid joint instrumentation tools at your disposal, and I'll be talking about through those this, this course and talking about how to download them and install them uh, in, a, in another uh, presentation. Important dates are all in the syllabus, and they change from semester to semester, so I'll let you find them there, and we'll also go over those. Uh, we'll also talk about the attendance and class expectations, collaboration. I encourage you to work with other people, and the details of that are also in the syllabus. Uh, we'll talk about the evaluations of grades and grading policy. There's two kinds of homework in the class, which I'll talk about also. We'll talk about the group project and presentation, the final grades of the course, software, and any other important items, and we'll answer any questions you might have. So here's the recommended text for the course. Uh, I'll just talk about each of these briefly. Uh, one is a rather new book by Mueller, Essentials of Computational Fluid Dynamics, and this is a small paperback book which is not too thick, and I think it's really a good book, and I think it's great for people who are completely new to CFD. A second book is Frizeger and Perique. This is Computing Methods for Fluid Dynamics, Springer 2002, and I actually read this book cover to cover when I was an undergrad, but this book is probably geared more to someone who wants to have like a balance of research and also understand computational fluid dynamics. I think this is a great book. It's not too expensive today. It's often a paperback. I encourage you to check that book, that book out. Another one is by Cummings. Uh, this is Applied Computational Aerodynamics. This was written out from the United States Air Force uh, Academy, and it's a rather thick hardborn, hardcover book. And the students are, today at least, at the time of recording this video, are required to have this book as part of their fluid dynamics curriculum. So that's a very good book, and it's definitely written from an applied side and written for undergrads who probably will enter the United States Air Force as officers and go out maybe afterwards to industry. Uh, it's not really from a, written from a research perspective or anything. It has a lot of, it's very, it's a very big book, has a lot of pictures. So, uh, you know, some people say, hey, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, I say an equation is worth a thousand pictures. Another book which is much more classic is the one by Tannehill, Anderson, and Pletcher, Computational Fluid Mechanics and Heat Transfer. This one is definitely written for a future researcher and programmer. Um, it's, I don't feel it's written for someone who's brand new to CFD, uh, like for a course like this. A recent publication by my colleague here at University of Florida is Bala Shandar's book, A First Course in Computational Fluid Dynamics, and that's typically the book used in our graduate curriculum when he teaches the course. And it's a very good book, and it's written over his um, decades of teaching and research experiments. A final one is Anderson. Uh, I see this book on a lot of people's uh, bookshelves. This is written by the Anderson, who's written a lot of other, other really good introduction uh, undergraduate textbooks in aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering. Um, this is probably the one I honestly recommend the least. It's uh, it's one of his first books he really wrote in the series of his books, and it doesn't have the same um, style as maybe a book like Introduction to Comp Compressible Flow, which I consider one of his best books. Uh, so I would probably honestly recommend that one the least. Uh, throughout the class, I'm going to be giving various handout materials uh, provided digitally, so you will have all of those, so that's wonderful. They'll be free to you through the class website. These are going to include journal articles, excerpts through some of these books, uh, and other kinds of material. So that's uh, what you should think about if you really want a book for the class. 
I do want to talk briefly about homework in the class. Uh, all the homework will be available through the class website as PDFs. You download that PDF, you can do the homework on paper, on your computer, type it up, save it as a PDF or scan it with your phone or a scanner and upload it to the class website, which currently is Canvas. All the due dates for all the homeworks and all the assignments are all on the class website. So please reference the class website for those. In this class, there are two kinds of homeworks. The first is traditional homework. The second is numerical homework. Traditional homework will be just like any other class, like a math class or a physics class. You just be written problems on paper. You don't need a computer to do it. There'll be no numerical methods. Those will be assigned on the first day of each module. I'll talk about the, that in a minute. But basically each module is, uh, you know, like grid generation, uh, numerics, fluid dynamics, turbulence, like I showed on previous slide. So it'll be one comprehensive homework set for each of those. Generally, those homeworks will be due at the end of the module. Uh, please perform and show all of your own work. Um, at the time of this video, I'm mentioning that, you know, I encourage you to collaborate and work in groups, but you must have your own assignment. And I would prefer that you write the names of people you collaborate with at the top of your work. So I encourage you to collaborate in maximum groups of three, you know, find digitally or in person, something you want to work with. And I'm sure there are previous semester solutions posted online. If you don't work through the homework yourself, uh, you're not going to learn. So some students fall into the trap of, oh, I'm just going to copy previous homework and my friend's homework. And when, uh, you know, the objective is the, the course is to learn. So you're not going to be learning that way. It's not a proven method for learning, unfortunately. Numerical homework, so that's the other track of homework, will be all CFD problem based. So these are going to be two types of homeworks, traditional and numerical in parallel, and they'll have kind of different due dates. All the due dates are on the class uh, website, so there shouldn't be a problem tracking them. Um, these will be actually doing CFD problems with um, the solver we're using in the class. It could be grid generation or visualization. And we're going to be exercising these solvers and making different kinds of grids and looking at different types of CFD solutions for their visualization. And all these will be uh, described in detail with kind of little tutorials in those homework sets. So that should be pretty exciting. Assignments are due in PDF format, uploaded to the class website by 11.59 p.m. And I do not accept late homework. There, has there will be a class project. Uh, which I'll talk more about in our online discussions, and I'm sure you'll have questions about it. Students are welcome to work in groups or individually. Usually I have students working in groups of two, which is my preference, and that way you can kind of help each other. And you're supposed to both uh, do the CFD problems uh, through the project. We'll assign this project in about the middle of the semester, which is about 20 classes uh, from now. And the project will consist of taking a journal article, which will be given to each group, and they'll take the journal article, which is written about an experiment. For example, it could be a wind tunnel experiment with an airfoil. The students will take the airfoil coordinates, in this case, um, make the computational domain, run the solver, generate fluid dynamic results, visualize, visualize them, and compare them to the experimental results and create a presentation out of that or a written document. And it's really your choice if you want to do the presentation. I prefer you do the presentation. It's a lot more fun because all the other groups can see the presentation. If you want to write a paper, we'll also um, go down that way so we can discuss that. You'll have to validate your CFD prediction with experimental results. That's the objective of the class project and to present that. You have to justify all the steps you've done through the whole CFD process for that CFD comparison with the experimental results. Think of it this way. If you cannot do a simple CFD run or prediction and compare it against a simple experiment, how can you do a computational fluid dynamics analysis of something like an engine or an entire aircraft or a vehicle or the human heart or the lungs or any other type of fluid dynamics problem. That is very difficult to do the most simple cases. And since this is a university and we're learning, we'll study the most basic flows like backward facing step, forward facing step, airfoil, etc. Um, we look at jets and shearlers in the class too. A lot of the fundamental flows, these are just like simple machines that we're looking at, like, you know, like pulleys and levers. 
fundamental flows in fluid dynamics are, are things like jets, shear layers, etc. I'm more interested in you learning the proper process than necessarily prediction accuracy. If you make a sports analogy, for example, that could be, hey, I'm going to learn to swing a golf club or a baseball bat. Well, when you're starting out, you don't want to develop bad habits and you're looking more at the form. It's the same in CFD. We're more interested in the process and making good choices than necessarily prediction accuracy. And even today, if you go look at the best people in this field making predictions, blind predictions against experiments to validate their codes, they can often be off by five or 10%, and that would be considered a very good prediction. For a flight test, I've seen a lot of CFD results where they're off by say 40 or 50%, and they say, wow, uh, that's a humongous error, and how do we resolve that using all our best practices? So it's a humongous challenge to learn computational fluid dynamics and be good at it. As far as required and supplementary materials concerned, we've put all that in the class website under the file section within subdirectories corresponding to the class section. So for example, there'll be a files directory called turbulence for the turbulence model, and I've put in all your reading materials and other uh, files for CFD solvers and all these sections. So you'll see that when you log into the class website. I'll also put required reading and the review of supplementary material in those folders, and those will be due uh, on the same corresponding day as the homework. I'm not checking if you're doing the reading. You know, you're a student, you're responsible for these things, and I, I just trust that you're doing it. So please keep up the reading. If you fall behind, the meaning of this course is gonna be, is gonna be much less too, unfortunately. A lot of the questions in the homework will be derived by the, or from the supplementary material. So when you're doing homework, and I've written exams, there may or may not be exams in this course, you gotta check the class syllabus is changes from semester to semester, so the recorded video will uh, mention that. Um, previously, we've had exams. This semester, we are not having exams. Let's talk about the major lessons of this course. The first one is the process of computational fluid dynamics. This consists of four major steps. One is define the problem. That's just understanding the problem. What am I trying to do? Uh, in my experience working with students, uh, new engineers, is that a lot of students, new engineers, just jump in and start programming or doing math. They haven't stopped to think and really understand the problem. A lot of people have spent a lot of their time doing analysis or computational fluid dynamics or something in another field, and they present a solution, but it was for the wrong problem. It is so important to stop and really define and understand the problem and what people have done previously. So don't just jump into things, and that's especially true of CFD. The pre-process means everything done before the numerical solver uh, attempts to solve the equations of motion to find the solution. So that involves defining the problem itself. That's really part of the pre-process in CFD. That is constructing the domain of where the fluid is. So the domain is like a closed volume, usually where you have a liquid uh, gas or plasma and then you say well what are on the edges of this three-dimensional volume or two-dimensional surface and that might be the boundary conditions the boundary conditions specify the solution or something about the solution on the edge of the domain once you have those things specified you need to create the computational grid the computational grid represents a number of points within the domain and how they're connected. We'll talk a lot more about that and what that is. But basically, CFD, the solver, the next step will try and tell you the solution within each little volume or each grid point of the computational domain. Once you set all that up, you now create a file or metadata, if you will, for the solver to read to, to tell it what equations to solve on the computational domain and boundary conditions that are specified. So the solver is the numerical algorithm that's solving the discretized set of equations. Once that's done and the solver is successful, and we'll talk about what it means to have a successful uh, numerical solution or a correct numerical solution, you need to post-process the data. That is where we're looking at things like drag and lift 
um, contours of pressures or densities or velocities or derived quantities like vorticity and uh, you know, maybe Q criterion. We'll talk all about those later. The next major lesson of this course is skepticism. How do I know I have a great prediction? How do I know it's good? How do I know it's correct? And that's extremely difficult to do in itself, and there's quantitative ways to do that. And we can also examine the solution to see if it makes physical sense. For example, we can set up a solution, get a converged result, but it could be not what we wanted. So quantitatively, we might have arrived at a solution for the equations of motion and appropriate boundary conditions on domain, but it doesn't make any physical sense. And that can happen. And the only way to recognize that is with experience and getting a physical understanding from examining flow. Uh, so that's part of developing a healthy skepticism to understand the results. In this course, we're going to understand uh, the first and second major lesson. All the commercial solvers and all the other CFD solvers pretty much all follow this general approach. So if you learn one, like a research solver, like SU2, or a commercial solver like star CCM or Fluent, you can easily go to other solvers and follow the same process. And they all have their own little quirks and things, um, but they all, they all should be easy to learn once you learn one. So it's sort of like your first foreign language you learn. It's very difficult, but then you start uh, developing your, your mind for that and it becomes easier with time. So once again, the course dichotomy and philosophy it has two major components, understanding basics of CFD, and understanding the basic knowledge of one CFD code, which in this case is the SU2 solver. We do not want this course to be about learning one specific tool or one specific CFD code. Okay, this is not a, a school uh, where we're teaching like the technical schools, like you just want to learn to use a lathe. That's not what we do in a university setting. University setting, we're teaching the academics and the fundamental theory and we're examining these fundamental theories uh, across the CFD um, curriculum with one particular code. So of course we want to learn the process through one particular code, but that's not the goal. The goal is to understand the mathematics and physics of fluid dynamics through a numerical solver. That's really the dichotomy of this class, is that we are torn between the time it takes to learn the solver, which is not trivial itself, that could be a course in itself in reality, with understanding all the basic principles of CFD so you can decide if it's a feel for you and how you want to really go forward. One quote I love uh, from Philip Holmes at Princeton Math, he once said, it is great to have your head above the clouds, but you better have friends with feet on their ground. And that's absolutely true in fluid dynamics. You can get into turbulence theory, but eventually you're going to have to have some friends who are programmers and running high performance computers on supercomputers to evaluate those turbulence models for actual applications. And so there's a whole range of people. There's people who are very applied all the way up to pure theory people uh, within the CFD community. And uh, we all have to rely on one another. So I think that's a really interesting perspective. So we're trying to use these lessons that we're learning in, in this classroom, be it digital or in person, to explore one CFD code and make predictions that are balanced by skepticism. So let's talk about, you know, what is CFD? So CFD is numerically solving an equation or set of equations that govern fluid motion. So for example, you can take the Navier-Stokes equations, which I'm hoping you've learned in previous classes. If you haven't, now's a good time to go online or find a book and review. And solving those numerically, not analytically on paper, but somehow discretizing the equations and trying to solve them numerically with a set of numerical methods. That's very difficult in itself. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Navier-Stokes equations. It could be the Euler equations, or it could be another set of equations that model a fluid. It could be a simpler dynamical system of equations that model a fluid. Whatever your systems of equations you choose is fine, but it has to capture the physics of the flow. That's a critical choice. In this class, we're mostly focusing on the Navier-Stokes equations with appropriate turbulence models. And we'll review all these equations in the fluid dynamics section. And I'll talk you about the different equations, and I'll tell you, um, you know, different types of flows where they have application that's appropriate. 
and over time you'll get a feel for which ones you can use. A lot of good CFD solvers today let you choose the system of equations uh, with appropriate turbulence models, and the solver we're using in this class is no different. As I mentioned, CFD involves multiple steps, and it has been developed over many, many, many decades, including numerical methods, so that means it's been being developed for well over 100 years, even before the advent of digital computers came along. And it's been done by mathematicians, engineers, computer scientists, etc. So there's lots to look at there. And I hope that you have an appreciation that some people have spent their careers in this field developing these techniques. There are many excellent CFD codes, and the really good ones I've noticed are developed by teams of professionals over the course of a few years to multiple decades. For example, the Fun3D CFD code developed by NASA, which I'll be showing examples of in this class and future classes, has really been developed over a couple of decades by a, a group of people that numbers anywhere between 8 to 30 at any some time. And that's used in production uh, NASA for NASA vehicles all the way down to fundamental experiments and validation and CFD research. So that's a very interesting way to look at good solvers. A lot of graduate students write their own safety solver. It's usually very simple for a very specific research task. And that's a wonderful way to really learn CFD too. So if you love this course and you understand the whole process, it's probably a great idea to try and go into that type of field. And of course, it's also nice. It's a, it's a field where there's a lot of demand for people. Uh, CFD is easy to learn but very, very difficult to master. So in this course, we'll be learning all these techniques and going through the whole process, and I hope that you can come out of it and approach a problem and define it, do a, create a CFD solution, decide if it's correct or not, and uh, use it to do design or analysis that's useful in your chosen field. That's, that's my goal, of course, but the whole approach is extremely difficult to master. So you're it's some people have spent their lives in CFD and are continually learning. So if you're in a field where you're continually learning in this contemporary era, you're very fortunate. And I encourage that through your career. Let's look at a brief historical context of CFD. So before the advent of digital computers, which really occurred in the 1950s, um, we still try to solve equations or simplified sets of our equations numerically. And this wasn't done by digital computers, this was actually done by people. And on the right, this is an image from NASA of a group of computers. At that time, all the computers uh, were generally women. And they would sit in big rooms and they would have numerical algorithms being done uh, in pieces. So every one of the computers would do a portion of the numerical algorithm. They would typically work from one part of the side of the room to the other and basically pass pieces of paper of numbers and do part of the algorithm. So it's a lot like Excel. You can imagine in Excel today, you have maybe a column of numbers and every previous row depends on the next, for example. And each row would be an individual computer doing some simple, simplified operations. And that's one example of numerical methods being done by people. At NASA for fluid dynamics, they would use teams of computers to evaluate simplified forms of the equations of motion to do aerodynamic predictions in the case of fluid dynamics. Um, it's really a beautiful history. I encourage you to go and uh, read more online. With the invention of digital computers, and over the last seven years from the 1950s, a lot has progressed. So today in CFD, the CFD groups, the experimentalists who are doing experiments and flight tests, and analytical uh, people like mathematicians or engineers doing more like modeling and math, are usually all tightly integrated together in teams uh, to try and find a goal. It's really hard today to imagine working in industry, academics, or government without this combined approach. So in a sense, the golden age of CFD development, which occurred during the Cold War for 20 to 30 years, occurred a lot in the United States. 
and the Allies. Um, it was very successful in the United States for one particular reason, and that's CPU development. So a lot of the CPU technology was invented in the United States and brought up to the United States. And that was mainly done for nuclear weapons development and computational fluid dynamics. It drove the processor development in that era. In the Russian system or the Soviet system is a little bit different. In the Russian system, unfortunately, they did not have uh, the processor technology that the Allies did. And this causes a little bit of a change in their viewpoint of how to develop and solve fluid dynamic problems. The Americans relied more on computers. The Russians have excellent education in mathematics and an emphasis on mathematical rigor. This caused them, because of their lack of processor development and the expense of having processors, to focus more on analytical and semi-empirical methods for fluid dynamic prediction. Nonetheless, on the right, I just want to show one example of some contemporary uh, analysis for CFD. And this is from NASA using the NASA Fun 3D CFD code. And it says, hybrid RANS LES simulation of launch abort system and computational Schlieren. So what you're seeing here are really two visualization results of this system. You'll see the vehicle, the airflow is moving from the top to the bottom really, and you're seeing contours. These could be contours of some fluid dynamic variable like pressure or density or some other variable. And then they put a plane through the flow. This plane is through the actual fluid volume itself, which in this case is air, and they've plotted gradients of density, and that's what we call a numerically generated Schlieren. In the lower left, you see the same type of vehicle surface. This is the actual surface of the vehicle, and you see like little lines on it. Those are actually the grid points and connectivity of the computational grid, which I discussed earlier. And you see it's colored. Well, it's colored by some fluid dynamic variable. Now, this is really for the public. It doesn't have any contour levels on it or anything which gives it a lot of value. And we'll talk more about generating these types of plots and generate some of our own in our homework uh, throughout the course. So here's very briefly a CFD case study. I won't spend too much time on this, but it's for the space launch system. So the space launch system might take off in the lower left and it accelerates through the transonic regime it, ma it experiences a maximum dynamic pressure. There's a solid rocket booster separation which falls to the Earth. And of course, there's a service model jettison which we saw CFD of in the previous um, uh, figure. And they jettison the abort system. And of course, the vehicle goes off to space. So the CFD study you saw in the previous slide is of the jettison launch abort system jettison. So that's only one part of the actual uh, ascent profile. So you imagine a CFD group involved in the development of the space launch system has to work on every part of the launch. Let's look at another part of the SLS development. So this is the one of the corresponding experiments. See up here you see this is the leading part of the vehicle, and the flow moves from the lower right of the figure to the upper left. And this is a wind tunnel experiment at the NASA Langley Research Center Unitary Plan Wind Tunnel in test section number two. This is a model of the vehicle, of course, and you can see here's like these little rockets, which are modeled back here on slide 21 in the lower left part of this figure. So you can see they've done one-to-one -one comparisons with experiments, both dimensionally correct of the full vehicle and the wind tunnel tests. And so they're getting data from their experiments, they're getting data from the CFD, and they've had modeling work done by theoreticians. All these groups come together to do model development like this to create a flight vehicle. In, case, in this case, the flight vehicle is the spatial system. So this is just from that one part of the ascent trajectory. Let's look at another. This is more for the deployment of these casings. This is a nozzle geometry. 
so you can get an idea of what's happening in the CFD. Here's a case where the same type of CFD groups looked at the launch pad structure and the flow from the rocket engines at different points. So here's essentially startup of the rocket, the SLS at the launch pad, and Kennedy Space Center. On the right, here's a cross view. In the lower left, the rocket's now ascended up to about a third of the height of the launch pad structure. And here in the lower right picture is a zoomed in view of the exhaust from the rocket. So what are we seeing in these pictures? You're seeing the gray part is the actual skin or, or surfaces of everything around the launch structure. So here's these boosters, here's the rocket nozzles and everything. And then you see contours. So there's different contours you're seeing and they're not labeled in these particular figures, which isn't too helpful because it's hard to say exactly what their contours of. This is a cross stream plane cut and then they have also put in some sort of streamlines or tracers. So this is SLS experiencing a crosswind direction. In the lower left, you can see isosurface contours of the flow coming out of the rocket engine, and that helps the engineers and scientists visualize the plume and how it goes through uh, the exhaust um, ports of the launch pad structure and out to the left and right directions. Here's one really great view I like. There's two different isosurfaces, one from, uh, you know, from two different types of engines. And you can see how they come down and mix through this exhaust spillway out to the environment. So this is just giving engineers qualitative visualizations of the flow and the launch structure. And of course, it'd be very difficult to get this kind of data from the actual field tests. That's one more SLS uh, study. This is a simulation, the separation of the uh, boosters. And you can see that, hey, they might need to model these to make sure that they don't swing back and hit the main body and damage the vehicle or hit one of the other rocket engines and lead to flight vehicle failure. So there's a lots of separation dynamics here. And what's interesting, this flow field where the flow moves from left to right and we have contours. Remember, this is a plane. The actual flow is three-dimensional around the vehicle. What you're seeing here along attached to this leading edge and other little corners, these are the shock waves coming off the vehicle. So we can capture all the shock wave and expansion dynamics around the vehicle. You see the colors are very different near the skin of the vehicle. That's actually the turbulent boundary layer. Back here we have rocket and plume dynamics. So we can capture all of this at different stages of rocket ascent. That's just one case. We can do all this same type of analysis for aircraft, for biological systems, for the auto industry, for the ship industry, yachts, sailing, um, granular flows. We'll talk about all these and more uh, through this class to give an idea of what application CFD might have and what it can do and what it can't do. So that's the basics of this course, and every course I'll have a slide that says next time, and that just means what we're going to be talking about in the next module. So we will be looking at an absolute crash course for beginners for CFD. We'll be looking at a set of the equations of motion, which are solved numerically. We'll look at the different times of computational grid types. We'll look at how they're discretized, these, these equations of motion, how they're discretized so they can be solved with a particular computational grid. We'll look at a few different numerical solvers. What are the numerical solvers? We'll look at solutions. What does it mean to have a converged solution? What does it mean to have a stable solution? We'll look at what the idea of grid independence is, which helps us alleviate some of our skepticism, which I'm hoping you develop. You always have to say, how do I know this result's right? especially when I have nothing to compare it to. I may not have an experiment. I might not have a flight test. For example, if I'm landing a vehicle on Mars, I've never landed that vehicle on Mars before. Maybe I'm going to a planet or moon I've never been to. I may not know much about the composition of the atmosphere. How do you know that those reentry aerodynamics are going to be correct? Well, you're going to use some CFD and you'll have to decide uh, using some quantitative analysis. Then we'll look at results of the CFD, what comes out of the solver, and how are they post-processed to answer many of these questions we have in engineering. Thank you very much for your time. Welcome to Computational Fluid Dynamics, and I'm your professor, Steve Miller.